Hey, it's Eric at Request Metrics. In the last video, you saw that we created SSH keys and can log into the box that we're gonna use as our dev environment. But we don't wanna be those assholes that say, it worked on my machine, so we're gonna use Ansible to make sure that we can repeatedly provision our dev environment. Check it out. What the fuck is this? So now we've got our SSH keys and we can log in manually with PuTTY to our Linux box. But we've learned that once we have more than one box, we actually wanna be able to automate this stuff in a repeatable process. And we really don't want people like cowboying, just like flinging commands at these boxes through PuTTY and then like they get in these weird inconsistencies. What's wrong with that, Eric? <laughs> let, me, let me cowboy my commands. That's not like we were- My servers are pets. I named <laughs> oh. them. We, yeah. I believe we tried the cowboy method and we realized with even a, a surprisingly few number of servers, like the, the error, the, the sort of the difference between them grows rather quickly. Well, for full backstory, when we started TrackJS at the very beginning, we did actually like one off each server. Like each server was a unique being with its own DNA. And when we actually made a big infrastructure move from Azure to OVH, uh, Todd was the one who pushed and said, hey guys, we should probably think about automating this so that like it's repeatable. And now TrackJS has like 34 servers. Largely because I didn't trust that OVH wasn't gonna be awful and we'd have to move again. It's, which, <laughs> which was very fair given, especially our experience with Azure, although we are still on OVH. So for now, anyways, that's uh, the plan. But the automation has actually become awesome. And when we looked at automation options, there was three. And I don't know if this is still the three, but we looked at Chef, Puppet, and Ansible. They all kind of do the same thing, but the big advantage that Ansible has over Chef or Puppet is that you don't need to install any kind of agent on the box itself. As long as you can SSH into the box and the box has Python installed on it, you can run these, these automation uh, commands for, from anywhere. And so it's, uh, as long as you're not doing hundreds or thousands of servers, it's actually really convenient and everything is just specified as a YAML document, so it fits in source control real easily. And it didn't involve Ruby, which was really mm. nice because nice. we're not... Ruby because fans. Eric's a Ruby hater. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's not my favorite language. I don't like slow languages that suck. Um, the first thing you might be wondering is like, we're running Windows and you actually can't run Ansible on Windows natively, but we have Windows 10, which has Windows subsystem for Linux. And it's good enough to run Ansible from Windows Subsystem for Linux. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna install Ansible, hopefully, and then we're gonna set up a very basic scaffold, the kind of a very, very simple Ansible directory structure, um, just to ping that server that we've already logged into, just to make sure we have connectivity. Uh, so I've installed uh, the Ubuntu WSL container or whatever this thing's called. Uh, so the first thing that we need to do in order to get Ansible on this box is to install Python. And so I've actually taken the liberty of copying and pasting uh, some of these commands just so you don't have to watch me flail typing them. Uh, ooh. So you are installing Python and pip, which is like the Python package manager. Yes, thank you. So we're installing yeah, both Python and pip because we're actually gonna install Ansible via pip. Yeah, uh, Ubuntu has a package for Ansible directly. However, we're gonna target a specific version because that's what we use on TrackJS. <laughs> and there's really no, and we, we're on version 2.4.1.0 on TrackJS. There's no real reason. We're not like stuck to it. It's just that upgrading things takes time and we don't have anything we need to do uh, that requires yeah. a newer version. And occasionally the, the new versions like change things or the obsolete things. And... and most importantly, Eric and Jordan are curmudgeons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't like change mostly. <laughs> There's just no reason to change if it's working. <laughs> <laughs>
Exactly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Ignore what you wanted, but I wouldn't give it to you. <laughs> okay, so now we need to install Ansible. So the way we're gonna do that is actually with pip, which is a Python package manager. And one of the reasons we're using it in this case is we want this specific version. Now you would not need this specific version, uh, but for our purposes to stay consistent with TrackJS, we're gonna do that. Yeah, and you could fiddle around with adding the right repository for, so apt could do it, but this is convenient. And this is gonna download a horrendous number of packages as well. Oh, really? Is this slow? It's, uh, so we'll see how fast it is. But look at that, you got it installed. We got it installed. Okay, so, so hey, look at us go. All right, so then uh, in, the, in the world of Ansible here, um, I've got a folder called DevOps, right? And this is where we're gonna build out our Ansible structure. Because uh, DevOps isn't about an organization, it's about a repository name. <laughs> and we needed a good name, and this was pretty, <laughs> and we're, we're DevOps guys. Um, one thing I've already added to this folder is just we, uh, we had that SSH key, uh, public and private, that we created in the last video. And so we wanted to make sure uh, we use those to connect to our box. I've already put those keys in this folder here, and we'll do more of those keys in a second. Uh, but the first thing we're going to do, actually, is we're going to create an Ansible uh, directory. Um, and then uh, there's, there's a couple different ways we can do this. Uh, but every Ansible, uh, and they're called playbooks. Like when you run a lot of tasks, uh, you run what's called a playbook. And so uh, we're gonna actually, we have to have two things in order to run a playbook. The first is a YAML file with your YAML markup describing the task that you wanna run. And the second thing you need is an inventory file. Uh, so we're actually gonna create the inventory file first. And so we create our inventory files uh, based on our environment primarily. So we're gonna make like a dev inventory file because that's what we have today um, and so uh, we're gonna we're gonna create Jordan what's this called this uh, we're just calling it RM yeah, but like what's the name in Ansible for that do you know oh like is it like a group is that a group it's like a group in? or something like that um, and then we yeah, just so arm yeah and so then and we'll use this group to refer to the hosts later uh, so inside of our playbook, we'll actually just define the host that we want to run the playbook against and so any host listed under this RM uh, you know, so, so for example, if we if we had a second one uh, and we ran against all of the RM hosts, we would run it against both of these. Yep. Question. Yes. Why uh, why would we group all of the things in dev into one inventory file? Could we, if we so chose, call this RM dash dev, and this is just the inventory file with everything in it? You could. You could. Yes. I don't know. Maybe because um, there's too many files that and, way. And so, <laughs> and so what we had done in TrackJS is we had had like, because there was like a web tier and there was like a server, to, you know, or like a processor tier. And so it was just a convenient way to keep all of our boxes in that environment, but then like segment them by grouping. Yep. So and you, so, Todd, I guess the one advantage is we also do some, which maybe we'll have a video later on, some advanced inventory file stuff where we'll say like there'll be a Linux group. So if we have operations we want to run on all the Linux boxes we have, we'll actually throw the RM group inside the Linux group. And so then we can actually hit like every dev machine that has Linux mm, okay. or every dev machine that has Windows or whatever. Obviously there's no Windows for request metrics, but. I guess my, my question, and this might be totally off topic for the video, more of my own edification is like, why, why do, do we have multiple inventory files versus just having one file called inventory oh. Oh, that okay. has that has both our dev stuff in it and our yeah. prod stuff. So do big... you ever target it by file and say, I wanna do things to all of dev for? So the big advantage is, so if we have a name called RM, the, the YAML file is gonna target, it's gonna say, you, we're gonna perform these operations on the RM group. Well, so if we wanna do prod, all you have to do is say, here's the inventory file for prod, which also has an RM group. So you can sw swap what things mm. are in RM that way. But to your, yeah, otherwise you have to do that. You could do this too. But then like you can't really statically define that in the YAML file. Gotcha. Okay. That was that was my question. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so so we've got our inventory, which right now is a is a sort of a one box deal. Uh, and so then we also need a playbook. And so uh, in TrackJS World, we have playbooks named by the thing. So like, there's the Elasticsearch playbook and the Nginx playbook. Uh, we don't really know what we're gonna need yet, so we're just gonna make a, re maybe I should just call this. Yeah. Well, we'll just call it rm.yaml yeah. for now. Yeah. 
And so this is going to be for now, until we find reasons to make multiple playbooks, this is what we're going to have. Um, so uh, for whatever reason, YAML starts with these three dots or these three dashes. I really, I don't, I am not a YAML expert. So I really. Yeah. So now we, we're targeting that group. Yeah. So, so whichever inventory we feed this playbook, it will find the RM group and run uh, the things that we do. And so we're going to uh, specify the remote user. Uh, so it's going to run as root. Uh, when it connects via SSH, right? Now why do we run as root versus running as some system or user ID? So we, we define our user that we're going to run it, and then we have a series of tasks, right? So this is a YAML list, and um, you can name each task. And so in this case, we'll give it a name, and we're going to call this uh, test connection, right? And so all we want to do right now um, is, is just see, can we connect to the box? And so Ansible has this huge list of modules, and I'll, I'll bring it up only because uh, it's kind of interesting to see. Um, module index. Module index. And so then we've got this all. all modules. And so if we, yeah. I mean, it's a long list of stuff that you can do, right? But so the one we're going to use today, and there's a bunch of these pings. So I'm going to skip. I mean, there's, you got, you want to use a Nexus switch and ping it? You got it, baby. But uh, anyways, uh, we're just going to use the basic ping command for starters, just to see, can we even connect to the box? Right, so I'm gonna save this. So if we try and run, and maybe we should do that. Do you think we should try and like actually run it right now and yeah, let's, let's see, try. see it fail? Um, okay, so let me clear this out because we got a lot of stuff here. Okay, I'm gonna go into my Ansible folder because that's where all of our stuff is. And I'm gonna run it with Ansible Playbook and I'm gonna feed it our inventory. Uh, and then I also need to give it uh, the playbook itself, right? So it's the dev inventory against the RM uh, playbook. And then one thing that we like to do kind of a sanity check if we if we add the list hosts flags um flag it's just going to tell us what what servers it would operate on it wouldn't actually do the operations and so this looks like what we want this is mostly so we're making sure we're, we didn't do the wrong inventory or, or the file or the yaml file specifies the wrong things so we don't delete prod you know, this is how we try and avoid prod accidents we've just never talked to this box before Okay, great, because we don't have an SSH key specified. So uh, back in Ansible world, we need to tell it what SSH key do we want to use. And so we want to use this request metrics key. But the problem here, at least from a Windows perspective, is there's a permissions issue. This key is too open in Windows. So one of the things we actually have to do from a Windows world, which is kind of hokey, uh, is we actually have to move this key. So um, we also need to tell Ansible where the key exists. There's a couple of ways we can do this. You can specify the private key directly following this. I think it's like Ansible private key equals and then the path, right? Something like that. You can do it for every host. So each host could have its own private key. We're lazy and so we're actually gonna do it uh, sort of globally, if you will. So if you make this ansible.cfg file, this config file, uh, Ansible will kind of read this file before it executes the playbook and do the things that are inside of it. Yeah, and there's some sort of, sort of Apache-esque and then it's recursing like level of precedent. So look for a file in your local directory and then like a global Ansible CFG in your like, in your home directory or whatever. And so I just pasted in, these are, these are kind of some of our basic things that we use in Track.js world. And so we'll just go over them quick. And so uh, so this is actually, we don't care. I mean, let's be honest here. How many people are actually host key checking, right? Like when, when, it, when it fires up that warning, it's like, hey, this host key is different. Like, do you ever say anything but yes, connect? So actually, so I would have got rid of that thing you just yes, did. Yes, yes. Yeah. Then where's our private key file, right? So our private key file, we're gonna look for it in home SSH request metrics. Uh, we put it here, one, just as a matter of convention, because on Unix-based systems, this is often where it is. Uh, and two, we're actually going to move this on Windows, because otherwise we're going to get permission errors. We also do pipelining true. I believe that one makes even a single box go faster. It, like, smashes a bunch of stuff into the box at once or reuses SSH connections or something. Okay. Supposedly faster. I know we tried in TrackJS long ago uh, with and without it, and it's faster with it. Okay. However, um, there's some gotchas with some of the like features of Ansible, which apparently we don't use. Use with caution, but uh, it is faster. And then this one is uh, 
like if, if specified with no hosts, it's not going to run against everybody. Yeah, so a playbook doesn't need to have the host specified. And a playbook without a host specified means run it against the whole inventory. At, like every group, just run against all the groups. So we put a default that doesn't exist so that if we forget to specify, it just won't work. This is just belt and suspenders because we're paranoid. <laughs> and there's nothing we want to purposely, like, on accident run everywhere. So here's what happens, right? So if I, if I change this, right, to point at this key file. So now we've got our private key specified. Watch what happens. So let's, re, let's rerun this here. Great. So it says fail to connect unprotected private key file. Permissions 055 for this file are too open. So we actually need to have it be like readable to the user only. The problem is this file lives in Windows. And so we actually can't set the exact permissions that it wants from WSL. So what we want to do is we want to actually take uh, the keys here. Uh, so I'm going to go up a directory, up a level, uh, grab the request metrics, and I want to put him into the SSH directory, right? Great. Uh, okay, and so if I... Uh, oh, and so let me, let me actually just go in there, right? Uh, great, so there we've got request metrics. Um, and then if we look at him, we can see he's got some executable permissions and things. We wanna get rid of those. And so the way we do that uh, is we set uh, change mod 400 on request metrics. And so now if we look at him, you can see that he's only user readable. So now if we go, Ah, uh, Todd, did you I use the minus? I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw. the minus. Oh my gosh, I'm like learning about that. You're getting better at Linux. Oh, humans, old dogs can learn new tricks. Um, okay, so now we've got the appropriate uh, permissions. Let's see what happens this time. Well, you got to change back yeah, your you CFG. Yeah, you have to change this to the spot. Yes. Uh, and so he is going to be dot SSH, right? <laughs> Real life development here, also, folks. It's a, Real it's, life it's, development. Yeah. This is a good lesson about Ansible too, which is like there often is a real useful message hidden in the scary red. Look at that works. Great. So now we know that we can reliably communicate with this server. And so I can, you know, I can I can run this again if I want, and I can ping things. We could ping any number of machines. Yeah, if very we had hundred machines, we could ping it. <laughs> All right, and so like what, what this ping, so that ping uh, is not really a ping. Like it's not just sending a, a ping packet out and hitting the box. What it's really doing is it's saying, can I SSH to that box and run the simplest Python script you can imagine that returns Pong or something and does it work? Mm -hmm. So you're like testing the end to end of how Ansible works, which is make the SSH connection, go in there and run something and get the result.